broadcast. It is November 27th, Tuesday. As we enter into the holiday season, this is a webinar about a broadcast that I've done many, many years previous. And my, from my earliest experience of wilderness therapy, what I learned was that winter and the holidays were really just wilderness therapy amplified, right? It was a time away from home at a time when um, people would be missing each other, when, when, the, when those, those wounds, those, those heartstrings would be pulled uh, extra strong because holidays we associate with family gatherings and with family traditions. Uh, also, the weather becomes much more rugged uh, for, for the clients. And so I'm going to touch on a little bit of the theory of wilderness therapy tonight, just a little bit, because really what we're talking about is we're talking about wilderness therapy turned up with the volume turned up. Um, so I'll get right into it. First of all, it's a changing season out there and every season has its difficulties, right? The, the summer can be extra warm. The, the spring can have a lot of bugs and mosquitoes. The fall can have cold rain. And of course the winter ha has freezing temperatures and snow, but, but really there's no season that is without its challenges. Uh, the winter brings up a special kind of challenge, especially because of the short nights. We, we, I want to say first and foremost that we make sure that all of the, the students and clients are protected and safe. And that if the weather gets extreme, that we have wall tents in our field areas where they can go to and seek and, and get shelter with a wood-burning stove and be protected from the elements if necessary. We also run a, a nomadic model. So that means that we're moving locations. We have a different winter location and a summer location. And in the spring and the fall, we're, we're migrating from one or, or to the other. Sometimes during those seasons, we'll actually transport them via a vehicle of some type. But oftentimes it's a migration. Um, and there's different elevation, different climates in each of those places. Each day, it's part of the, the protocol of the program, the state regulations, they get hot food. That's a part of it. Uh, and that essentially what I would want you to know is they're either moving, and if they're not moving, which keeps them warm, they're either sitting next to near a fire or they're in their sleeping bag, which is rated far below any of the temperatures that they experience out there. So there's always a way to, to, to get warm. And importantly, I'll say this, it becomes the, the metaphor for, for life. A lot of staff will ask me as we enter the holiday seasons, the short, the short days, you know, we're spending so much time around physical safety and instruction and keeping the, the clients and students warm and, and safe. How can we get to a lot of the therapy? And my response over the years has been, that is the therapy. And the therapy, keeping safe and warm becomes a metaphor for living a healthy and safe life outside of evoke therapy programs. And so we're really using the same kinds of relationships, instruction, uh, education, practices to, to to make sure that they're all safe that we would if we were talking about cutting or depression or anxiety or drugs or alcohol. It's a very similar similar or parallel process. And this really speaks to the idea that wilderness therapy is experiential. And it does translate to home in the, in the sense that you're, you're, you're meeting similar challenges. In wilderness, especially in the wintertime, you cannot take anything for granted. I tell this story often to highlight this. Years ago, I, I was called to be, a, when my son was in Boy Scouts, I was called to be a Boy Scout, one of the Boy Scout leaders. And part of our, our, our the request was winter camping. And they looked at me and I, I worked in and ran a wilderness therapy program. So they said, this guy's gonna be perfect for winter camping, but they really didn't know me. So I kind of cheated and I hired one of my senior level staff to help me with that and to set it up and we had to hike and, and certain temperatures and, and camp in certain certain, temp, certain temperatures, excuse me, with a certain amount of snow for them to get the badge. And so we had the Boy Scout, Scouts in one of the canyons in Utah, and it was a challenging day. There was already a couple of feet of snow on the ground, and it started to snow in the late afternoon as we were finding our campsite. And I remember when we were challenged with getting the campsite organized, these were Boy Scouts not in there for treatment, and they were much less cooperative than our students are in the field. And that just goes to show you the students in the field, clients in the field, they learn that you can't take things for granted, that you have to work, that nothing comes easy out there. So 
working with the Boy Scouts. It's, it's a long night. They're having snowball fights. They're pushing each other in the snow. They're having a great time. And me and my staff are stressed out because what happens after the sun goes down is that the temperature drops dramatically. And if you're wet or you have snow, then it can become unsafe or at least uncomfortable. So we're working really hard to keep them warm. We're, we're trying to get dinner ready. We have these foil dinners that we had prepared so that it would be somewhat easy to, to prepare and to feed them. And so we get the, the, the foil dinners cooking as the sun goes down and ended up that half of the dinner was, was frozen and half of the dinner was burnt. And there was just a little bit in between that was okay. So then we play some games at night and we get them into their sleeping bags at night and make sure that all of them are safe and have the right gear. And then I get into the, the, the staff or, or the leader shelter and I, I turn to my staff member and I say, how do you do this? I know on your weeks off from the field, you go and do this on your vacation time. And then you go eight days in the field and do the same thing. And this was such a stress, stressful and difficult day because as a wilderness therapist, I'm not really involved in the, the day-to-day logistics with them. I'm making sure that the clinical direction with each child and with the group is going in the direction that we want. So I don't, I don't, I'm not tasked with that. And so I said to him, how do you do this? And he said, without making a big show of it, he said, it just doesn't get any more real than this. And I remember thinking that's so simple and so beautiful. And I think about wilderness therapy and this idea that we talk about getting out of wilderness therapy, the clients and the students will talk about getting out of it and getting back to the real world. And I'm not so sure that we don't have it backwards. Because in primitive living, mindfulness is heightened. You, you tend to stay present. There aren't as many distractions. There aren't, aren't as many escapisms out in the wilderness. And so maybe out there, it's a lot more real. And while we do not emphasize the, the, the loss and, and the missing of family out in the wilderness, it comes up for each of our clients and students. And we lean into that, that pain and that discomfort. I often say it's, it's not the, the holidays of 2018 that we're investing in. It's the holidays of 2019, 20, 21, 22, and so on. And we want you, and so do your family, so does your family. We want you to be home as soon as it's therapeutically appropriate and possible for you to have success at home. And again, we don't emphasize it and make the point, but we, we use that, that pain, that difficulty, that discomfort to help them develop an appreciation. There's a famous Buddhist teacher who says, the first thing that happens for people when they feel a toothache coming on, when they feel a toothache in their mouth, is they recognize that they've been taking for granted the non-toothache. And if none of us have a toothache tonight, think about that. Have you thought about the fact that you're pain-free in your teeth today or any time recently? And of course, unless you're practicing mindfulness, you, you don't think of that. So out in the wilderness, there, there is a, a heightened ability, pathway to mindfulness, to being present even if that presence is at times uncomfortable. We don't hike at low temperatures. In fact, we, we, we make sure that we're near wall tents, near fire, um, taking shelter if the temperatures drop significantly. And, and they don't do it often during the winter, but if they do, we make sure that, that, um, that we're, we're taking all the precautions. And again, we're, we're, making that, we're taking those opportunities to apply the lessons to home. You know, you have to listen to the staff. The staff know more than you. The staff essentially feed you. They make sure we don't take students and clients' safety for, for granted. We don't um, rely on them. Because some of them have poor self-care. And so we're going to make sure and manage and make sure that they're safe and, and everything is going well for them. Feet, toes, everything. So it's a, it's a, it's a busy day out there in the winter. The, the staff, the groups call in, each group calls in twice a day, mandatory, to check in, to find out about storms, weather coming in, temperatures, so forth and so on. So they're coordinating with our back backup and logistical staff to make sure everybody's being taken care of. Like I said earlier, monitoring their feet, hands, their hydration. It's very important to be hydrated in the wintertime. It, it, it's, it's hard because you have to go to the restroom more, but... It also 
helps the body maintain its warmth. And like I said, this is the therapy. This is not separate from the experience. This is the experience. And when you can use small group living, relationship between students, clients, and staff, when you can use the here and now, you don't have to extrapolate from academic you know, thought experiments or, or cognitive processes, but you're actually doing it. It's really easy to see the student, to see the client, to see their relationship, to see their challenges with regard to authority or communication or cooperation or, or how they get along with peers under this kind of stress. I've said this before. I've, I listened to a podcast recently that said that one of the ways they train astronaut teams is to take them out into a wilderness experience. They said that it doesn't work as well if they just do contrived team building experiences or, or recreational experiences together, that they have to have challenge. They have to experience vulnerability. They have to have an experience where they rely on each other for the success of the trip. Those are all the things that we do in primitive living nomadic models. I remember when I, my very first day in 1996, when I, I met the first staff, before I met my first student in wilderness therapy, and I, I hadn't heard of wilderness therapy at all just a couple of weeks before this day. And I asked the staff member, Clay, what was his name actually? He said, so what is this? I know therapy, but what is wilderness therapy? And he said, therapy is on the ground. Most people don't live on the ground. And he was speaking metaphorically, but it made sense. It was just the here and now, just living, just relating, just going through challenges. And this is real, he said. There was an experience I remember many years ago that I tell often and that, I'll, that I'll share with you in the hopes that you can do the same thing. Not just now, but also in life. It was a particularly cold day. And, and it was cold because it was raining. It wasn't yet snowing. It snowed later on that evening, late October. And I was having a difficult time keeping the fire lit. We had a shelter, and so the, the, the smoke from the fire was you know, getting in our eyes, and we were coughing. And then we finally were, were doing our sessions in our sleeping bags. And it was just a great challenge to have a, a conversation with each of my clients, my students. And in between one of the sessions, I turned to Steve, the staff member, and I said, I'm going to give you five minutes to convince me not to have the rest of the sessions this week in my car, which was and is not our policy. And Steve just said, all he needed was one sentence. He just said, teach them how to struggle. Teach them how to go through something difficult. And immediately it, it, it transformed for me. My, my suffering, my struggling had purpose. It was a metaphor for all of the challenges that they've had in life and are, are having in life that lead to the, the escape routes, the self-medication, the avoidance. So I was going to show them how to struggle through the day, which I did, and a lot easier because I, it had that meaning be, behind it. I remember one day a student walked up to us during a staff up. We were having a staff circle discussing our plans for the evening particularly cold and windy day. And the student said, you know, do I have to take a billy bath? That's a, that's a bath they take out there with, uh, with heated up water and behind a, a shelter. And the student came up to us and said, do I have to take a billy bath? Well, will I get in trouble? Will there be a consequence if I don't take a billy bath? And the, the staff started to give him a, a lecture about the necessity for it. And all I said to the student was, it's hard, isn't it? It's a pain. Didn't tell them they had to. Just empathize with the struggle, that you can't take anything for granted out here. And we take showers and, and indoor plumbing for granted every day of our lives, most of us. And the student just shrugged his shoulders and walked away and, and, and took his bath, cleaned himself. So they get it. And it, and it does become a metaphor 
for how to deal with everyday challenges in life. And I always say this for most of our students and clients, almost all of them, and there are some exceptions to this, of course, the most challenging things in life haven't happened to them yet. And as you folks know, because some of the most challenging things that happen to us in life are the challenges that we have with our children, especially when our children struggle. And then, of course, there are many others. We know that that's true. So we're teaching them how to feel, teaching them how to feel through something uncomfortable, something difficult. We're offering them empathy, empathy and compassion. We have boundaries and structure around it. But essentially, we're teaching them how to feel. The logical and natural consequences of wilderness, you can't argue with Mother Nature. I've seen students try to debate almost anything in the world, but you can't debate if you didn't build a good shelter and it collapses on you in the, in the middle of the night because of water or rain. And then everybody has to get up and you have to heat it, heat it up and dry things off by a fire. Right? Th those are the things that, that teach the student without us saying anything at all. And like I said, it adds emphasis and intensity to what we already do. It's like wilderness therapy, only more. And I always halfway joked about the fact that if my child had to go to wilderness, that I would want him or her to go in the winter. And lo and behold, my child obliged by getting themselves into a situation where wilderness therapy was the perfect answer. My son, my oldest. And he was out there for Thanksgiving, the December holidays, New Year's Day, his birthday. And it was just that. It was wilderness therapy intensified. I think it's a better program in, in the winter. I really do because of the challenges that I'm mentioning. I talk about this, and like I said, I'm going to talk about wilderness therapy, touch on it just lightly. The idea of Abraham Maslow's theory, where he says that we go through various stages, they build upon, they build upon each other throughout our life. And, and, and he says that if the physical and safety needs aren't met, you can't move on to higher level needs. And, and wilderness therapy shows us, and primitive cultures show us, that it's in the context for the struggle to survive, that we learn what it means to belong. We learn what it means to be a self. Many parents that I work with, and I'll put myself in the category with those parents, struggle growing up. I grew up with little to no money in our home. Single mother, didn't have a lot of money. We would run out of it before the end of the month and just kind of have to cross our fingers and, and drink powdered milk by the end of the month. Our grandparents made sure we didn't starve, but it wasn't that comfortable. And so I didn't have many, much choice but to work. And then I have a profession and a career that provides my family with a decent quality of life. And it becomes in some ways more difficult to, to, to pass those lessons on to children. It feels somewhat contrived for a lot of us. And I can't tell you how many families, it's not true of all of them, of course, but how many parents and families have told me that, that they have a similar challenge? And so wilderness therapy is a, a reversal back to a time, back to a culture, maybe back to something that looked like some of the lives that we grew up in, the situations that we grew up in where you really have to work. You have to work together. You have to listen. You can't take things for granted. You have to communicate. You have to function at a higher level as a human for the day to go better in a primitive living situation. From my book, the wilderness therapy teaches that within the context of struggling to survive, a person learns who he is, what it means to belong, and what it means to be interdependent. Within the wilderness context, one learns values. If you choose not to make a fire, you'll be cold and unable, unable to heat up, eat a hot meal. If you aren't careful when building your shelter, you'll have an uncomfortable night of sleep. In situations like this, truths about preparation, patience, and organization are inescapable. And I love this quote from one of the creators of wilderness therapy over 30 years ago. He said, whenever we adopted what we have come to call contrived experiences, the overall impact diminished for the participants. Original wilderness therapy programs in the 1970s didn't have therapists. It wasn't really until the 90s that they became 
clinical, therapeutically grounded. But it's still true today with our programs. It's oftentimes the best lessons, the most impactful lessons are not the ones that the therapist creatively creates, but that just happen in the course of primitive living. During the holidays, we have traditional holiday practices and, and meals. And they, of course, really enjoy that. In fact, I don't remember all of my Thanksgivings in my life, but I remember the ones that I had in the field vividly. They're, they're, they're so much more meaningful in some ways. We celebrate and appreciate and talk about family. We talk about traditions, sometimes extra letters, cards. Your, your parent coordinator can talk to you about what's expected in your group. We don't want you to try to compensate with gifts for any guilt that you might be feeling. Less is more when it comes to gifts in wellness therapy. Your parent coordinator will be sending out a letter if they haven't already, letting you know what's appropriate. We talk about the student or the client's path that led them away from home. How did they get here? It's an opportunity, like I said, to, to enjoy and cement the lessons of the program, to plan for future holidays. And we invite everybody to bring whatever their family traditions, celebrations, religious beliefs are to the group. And everybody has an opportunity to share those with the group and, and to, to, to be honored by the rest of the group and to learn. My basic take home uh, are don't apologize for the program. It's not something, it's, it's the greatest gift. Let go of, in the short term, at least, if not in the long term, of needing them to be grateful for, in the moment at least. It is a great gift, and it's your best guess. And guilt is going to prevent you from showing up as the most authentic and capable parent. Guilt is something that we must do battle with in order to parent more effectively. Let them struggle, gain self-confidence that comes from the struggle, and enjoy resilience. I say all the time, the first thing I learned in wilderness therapy was how amazing the staff are. And the second thing that I learned was how resilient the kids are. And, and they learn that too, and it makes a big difference. This is an investment. and In a, in a way, I think in the winter, th there's, a, there's a doubling on your return of the value of it all. Suffer with them. Don't, you don't have to go outside and camp. I've had parents that have refused to wear winter coats in the winter or, or camped outside or try to punish themselves for the, for the creature comforts that they could take for granted at home. You don't need to do that, but learn how to feel. Learn how to be present. Learn how to model going through an emotion instead of trying to avoid it. And then the gift you can do for them, I say this all the time on the on the Q&As, the open forms, the ones for siblings, do your work. That's the greatest gift that you can do. That's the greatest honor that you can give them. Be vulnerable. Show up not knowing. Show up as a student. Go to therapy. Go to your Al-Anon and your CODA meetings. The 12-step meetings that we ask you all to go to. And, and learn to let go. Learn to let go of outcomes. Readings can be something. You can read along with them. Your assignment. The non-assignment is sometimes parents need to realize that it's okay for them to enjoy their life, that they don't have to be punishing themselves. And if you're asked to not write a letter, to not do something, something extra, that is its own work. That, is, that has its own value. So I'm happy to take any live questions that you might have about winter wilderness therapy or the holidays. I'm going to go through some uh, updates, announcements and then I'll go to questions and answers again at the end. We would like you to attend all parents to attend six 12-step support groups. Any combination of Al-Anon, CODA, or Families Anonymous. Please attend six while your, your child is with us. You can also go to NAMI.org and free resources and classes in your area.
on social media. All of these broadcasts are available on the podcast app on your iOS device, your iPhone device, Apple device. Search Evoke Therapy Programs on the podcast app. On an Android device, download the SoundCloud app and search Evoke Therapy Programs, or you can go on any computer to soundcloud.com and search Evoke Therapy Programs. Follow and subscribe there, and all of these will pop up on, on your device when they're available. On Twitter and Instagram, follow us at Evoke Therapy. On Facebook, search Evoke Therapy Programs. This isn't just fun stuff. This is inspirational stories, links to blog, new information, great quotes, pictures from the field, things like that. That's what comes up. That's what we use our social media for. Also for announcements for events all over the country. When we have a therapist, when I go and speak somewhere, or we have a therapist or myself go and host a, a parent support group in a city, we post it on our social media. You can find the Evoke Family Foundation on Facebook. That's an orga organization of alumni parents who, who have gotten together to help raise money for people that, that can't afford therapy otherwise. And then, of course, go to our Evoke Therapy blog for updated content. My book, The Journey of the Heroic Parent, is available on Amazon, paperback, or audio versions of it that are, are there. Our upcoming workshops, uh, the next one will be in our Bend, Oregon location, December 8th through 9th. Please email melanie at for more information. If you want to go to a Finding You intensive, you want to do a deeper dive for your work, these dates aren't up to date, go to our website or email intensives at evoketherapy.com. We do private custom, we also have individual ones for, for parents or, or any adult. All right, um, some of the dates for the parent support groups I haven't updated. So, what's the next one? We will be in the Bay, I will be in the Bay Area on December 11th and in New York City on January 14th. Um, we're also gonna be in Los Angeles in January. Pursuits trips are for young adults or families. Think Therapy Light, Think uh, a reconnection, um, sober fun, those kinds of things. Anywhere in the world, any kind of activity, custom design for families or, or young adults. All right, happy to take questions. Why is something sweet like a coffee cake not appropriate gift to send? What about cheese or crackers as a gift? Well, specifically, we want to minimize the amount of processed sugar that they have. And we do give them some sweets around the holidays. So they're not, it's not completely void of any of that. So I want you to know that. But what has happened in years past, in our early years, is if every parent sends a little bit of sweets and junk food, you end up with a lot of sweets and sugar in the field. And part of what makes this model work is the change in diet, exercise, and sleep, just those things. So we just want to reduce the amount of sugar. Ask your parent coordinator what's appropriate. Cheese and crackers sometimes can be beef jerky. I always liked photo albums for my students. I like cards. I liked a, a game or trinket that they could play like a hacky sack or a frisbee that when we were having mandatory fun time out there that we could use as a group. But talk to your parent coordinator about what is expected. And some therapists have different approaches to that. So I can't speak universally for that. Can siblings, grandparents, aunts, uncles send Christmas letters besides the parents? Again, talk to your therapist. I always included that. And almost always included the, the, a phone call for any student that was at that point around the holidays, often the day before when family was gathered. But talk to your, your therapist, your child's therapist, or your parent coordinator. That is something that is often done that I often did. And it's gonna take a little while to get there and you're gonna to need to collect it. So talk to them about that this week. Just a comment from a parent. My son attended in the winter and he said it was glad it was in the winter. Through all the therapeutic programs he attended, my son thanked me for wilderness. He knows it was a gift. Glad to hear. My son too. My son talks about it. My son's 25 now. He was there 11 years ago, and he talks about it as an absolute gift for him. It makes a difference in his life today. And, and I want to say something to you. It's very important that you not be attached to them thanking you. If you need them to thank you, it's going to be more difficult for them to appreciate it. In other words, let them not like it. Let them be angry. Let, let them be not grateful for it and be okay with that. Be humble about that, open about that. And that's the best way to help them move through 
any anger, resentment that they might feel. But if you get invested, if you need them to feel a certain way, and by the way, this goes with almost any topic. If you need them to feel a certain way, you're engaged in the fundamental power struggle in human relationships, wanting to change or control how somebody feels, dismiss how somebody feels, erase how somebody feels. That's, that's a, the, if not the fundamental dynamic that's problematic in relationships. It's definitely one of the top few. If you do not do so many hikes in the cold weather, what do the kids do for exercise? We do day hikes. We do activities and games. And we are hiking a lot of days. The weather only gets extreme enough for them not to hike on, on some occasions. I remember one winter five or six years ago where it happened for 28 straight days. And that was a real challenge. And then it becomes a different kind of challenge, really. You, you deal with what is, what's outside of your control. You practice teaching and, and, and living with, with radical acceptance. Because even we, as, as program officials, as people who run the program, we can't control the weather. So you deal with whatever it is. There are other opportunities for exercise, though. Day hikes, games, and activities. And we try to hike them as often as possible in the winter as long as the temperatures drop, don't drop too low. What things do they do in these long, dark evenings? Dinner, sit around the fire, group therapy sessions. I, I really like I, the, the long summers days are, are, are pleasant in some ways, but the campfire is special. You know, I actually have this painting uh, that I had commissioned uh, that's behind me. You can't see it perfectly, but it's, it's me and a couple of students sitting around a, a fire at night in the wintertime. So campfire games. Sometimes they'll read stories. Sometimes they'll play games. Sometimes somebody will play an instrument. You can just have fun time. But, but group therapy is something that happens almost every night around the fire. All right, folks. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for on behalf of your child for the work that you're doing to show up here. And, and I hope as you go through the holiday seasons, that you could both feel and lean into the discomfort of it, to, to embrace it, because it's also part of and connected to the love and the connection and the hope that you have for your child and your family, and you can model that for them. Model being a whole person, not just the person who pays attention to, to the happy and the good things and tries to avoid the bad. That's one of the greatest gifts that you can give to them. Try to be present with them, try to listen to them, try to hear what they're going through, and know that this kind of experience, this intense experience at this precious time of year is perhaps more valuable than anything that they can go through in their lives and that you can go through as a family. So thank you for joining us tonight. Have a great week. Take care. I'll talk to you in a couple of days. Bye-bye.